You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back to the broadcast, friends. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you tonight, as every night, from the sunny climes of Western Japan. Actually, today, the rainy climes of Western Japan. But wherever you're listening to me in the world tonight, thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and I'm going to be your host and guide for the next hour of radio programming right here. And we have uh, quite a broadcast lined up for you tonight, and in fact, every night this week, it's going to be quite a jam-packed transmission. And once again, no matter where you are in the world, I'm sure you are noticing the temperature is rising on a number of fronts in a number of different ways. And of course, we've seen the uh, embassy protests and the the uh, is- Islamic protests that are spreading across uh, North Africa and the Middle East right now. We also see some action here in East Asia as things really do start to heat up between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands. There's a lot going on, so we're going to be casting our net pretty widely this week and going around the globe for some very interesting interviews with some hard-hitting guests, starting tomorrow night where we're going to be talking to Vinny Eastwood of the Vinny Eastwood Show at thevinnieeastwoodshow.com. And he's based in New Zealand, and he's going to be giving us the perspective on the globalists and the encroaching New World Order from that New Zealand perspective. We're also going to be talking to Michael Vale, our old friend Michael Vale of StratRisks.com, on Wednesday night. We're going to be talking to him about the latest of what's happening here in Asia and also some other hot spots around the globe. And once again, StratRisks.com, a great source on geopolitics and so many different fronts and so many different levels. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. And then on Thursday night, we're going to be talking to Matias Rojas, who is an activist in Chile. So we're going to be really, truly spanning the globe in the next few days, and we're going to be talking about what's happening in the uh, Chilean student protests and other things that are happening there in Chile, and it's going to be an interesting conversation. For people who don't know, I talked to Matias Rojas a couple of years ago now about his confrontation of David Rockefeller, which was uh, quite an intense confrontation. Well worth seeing and checking out on YouTube if you haven't yet done so to see uh, Matias Rojas really laying into uh, David Rockefeller and calling him calling him out for the uh, the ghoul that he is. So again, some very interesting broadcasts lined up, some interesting guests the next few nights. And then on Friday night, for the Friday Night Highlights edition this week, we're going to be taking a look at my newest DVD that will be coming out later this week. It's The Last Word, Volume 1. So the last year, I had a video series called The Last Word. I did uh, seven episodes of that last year. I'm starting that series up again now, and I'm going to do another six or seven this year. But uh, now for the first time on DVD, I'm going to be releasing those seven episodes of The Last Word from last year. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the uh, the videos that you'll be getting on there. Also, we'll be giving away one, one free copy of that DVD on air here on Friday night. So you'll definitely want to tune in for that. But tonight we're going to try something completely different. We're going to be taking a look at a very interesting and very nuanced uh, topic that I hope will generate some interest and hopefully spur some conversation. We're going to be talking about, well, truth, the nature of truth. What is truth? How do we define truth? How do we get to the truth? And we're going to be doing that by taking a look at a very specific website that has uh, garnered a lot of criticism from a lot of people, and deservedly so, but still manages to hold a very interesting point in our society, especially a society that is more and more getting its information online. And that website, of course, is Wikipedia. What role does Wikipedia play in our modern society? How does it control information? Is it a gatekeeper? Is it nothing more than a gatekeeper? Can it be used and exploited for an information resource? Or should we simply throw the baby out with the bathwater? A lot of questions to ponder, so we'll be going more into that tonight as we start exploring the Wikipedia phenomenon. So stay tuned right there. We'll be right back after these messages. All right, friends, welcome back to the program. Welcome back to Corporate Report Radio. Here we are on this Monday night, and we're going to be talking about something that I've referred to repeatedly on this broadcast and on my podcast and other pieces of media that I put out there as the bastion of truthiness, picking up on that phrase that Stephen Colbert popularized, truthiness, to talk about 
our modern conception of truth and how it's been something that's uh, that's certainly malleable and given to uh, spin and corruption. And I think we uh, we all know how that works in various ways and on various levels. But uh, certainly our conception of what is truth and how do we arrive at some sort of collective understanding of what has truly taken place has really changed in the wake and the advent of that website, Wikipedia, in which supposedly is the repository of human knowledge at this point and is the largest encyclopedia ever assembled by human hands. And uh, in, it is quite a remarkable phenomenon, and there is much to be said about it, but I suppose I should start with my own reminiscence of the time about eight years ago, just before I moved out here to Japan, I was working in a publishing office in Canada, and I was uh, doing some fact-checking, and for this fact-checking for one of the books that we were publishing, it basically required me to take every documentable, verifiable fact and to find at least two sources to back it up. One of them tended to be Encarta, the Microsoft encyclopedia that probably no one even remembers existed at this point, but which was at least somewhat in use at that time. And there was uh, the option to find another reputable source somewhere online to try to back up whatever claims were being made. And it was about that time that I started to notice that whenever I would punch in a search term on a given fact or some, some something about uh, how many liters of water flow through this or that river at a given time or whatever the, the fact in question might be, I would often find myself being directed to these uh, websites that would all have identical information but would all have different advertising and logos and things on them, but would all have the same core information and they would be basically what looked to be like encyclopedia entries about a given topic. And little did I know what I was encountering was the first iteration of the Wikipedia phenomenon where the uh, Wikipedia information was being scraped off and served out by various different uh, websites that were basically just leeching off of that information. And it wasn't long until Google, the arbiter of all things online, started making the Wikipedia link the number one link for pretty much any topic that you would think to s plug into that search engine if you are unfortunate enough to still be using Google. So whatever t topic might strike your fancy if you type in the keywords, Wikipedia will probably be top of the list or very near the top. And because of that, it has become a very important resource and a source of information for people around the world, really. Um, anyone operating in the English language, certainly. And of course, there is Wikipedia in other languages as well. So it is certainly a cross-cultural, cross-linguistic phenomenon. And as it has grown in size and in stature, it has, of course, grown in importance in directing the societal conversation so that it has become an almost default history for humanity, a, a way of understanding what we know and what we think we know about the world we're living in. But it does raise some very interesting questions about what truth is and how we arrive at that truth. And there are a lot of different anecdotal examples that we can point to of some very strange things that have taken place over the years with regard to Wikipedia. But this one in particular caught my eye quite recently. Just earlier this month on Ars Technica, they had a story about Philip Roth, uh, the author of such novels as The Human Stain, who found that uh, he was not apparently a reputable or credible source for changing the information on the Wikipedia entry of his own book. So from Ars Technica, September 7, 2012, they had this story under the headline, Wikipedia told Philip Roth he's not credible source on the book he wrote. Quote, American novelist Philip Roth is so famous that there's a Wikipedia page about his life and numerous Wikipedia articles about individual books he's written. But by the sometimes strict editing process enforced at the collaborati collaboratively edited online encyclopedia, Roth himself was recently unable to fix what he calls a glaring error in the Wikipedia page about his novel The Human Stain. Roth's complaint was detailed by Roth himself today in an open letter to Wikipedia published by The New Yorker. Roth tried to fix the error that his novel was allegedly inspired by the life of the writer Anatoly Broyard. In reality, Roth explains, the book's story was inspired by an event in the life of Roth's friend, Princeton professor Melvin Tooman. Tooman was trying to track down a couple of students who had never attended class and asked if they were spooks. 
The two students were black, leading to accusations of racism against two men. When Roth tried to give Wikipedia the true origins of the novel, he says he was told by a Wikipedia administrator on August 26th that I, Roth, was not a credible source. I understand your point that the author is the greatest authority on their own work, but we require secondary sources, were the exact words of the Wikipedia administrator, according to Roth. Wikipedia's rules, of course, are intended to prevent people from excising uncomfortable yet true facts from their articles. All facts must be backed up by re resource references to specific sources. As it turns out, the open letter Roth wrote today seems to count as a secondary source. Edits made to the article today add a reference to his open letter, including the explanation that Tuman probably inspired or Tuman's problem inspired the book. So I'll let you continue reading that article. Um, basically, it just goes on to say that the situation has kind of corrected itself now that Roth wrote that article in the New Yorker. Now that can be cited by the Wikipedia entry on the book as a reference to this fact that he's stating that the, the book was based on the life of his friend and not on this other person that it was alleged to be about. It's a rather roundabout process at getting to the, the truth of the matter, though, and in this kind of case, it, it really does seem like a head-scratching phenomenon that we have the author of a book trying to tell Wikipedia, no, this is not what, uh, what the truth is, this is not what I based my book on, and Wikipedia not allowing him to do so because, well, we need a secondary source, we can't rely on a primary source. At first blush, this does seem like a very bizarre and awkward position for Wikipedia to be in and to be self-evidently kind of putting themselves out there as not something that corresponds to the truth, something that is not actually the truth, it's just based on other people's opinions. But when you actually start to think about it, there may be some logic to this type of reasoning, and that is provided in the top-rated comment for this Ars Technica uh, piece, which reads, Admittedly, it sounds Byzantine, but it's the only way to maintain anything like credibility. Do you want George Lucas to go to edit this, the wiki pages on Star Wars and note that Greedo always shot first? Enforcing a secondary source means he first has to convince some citable source that it's what happened, which provides a check that Wikipedia's crowdsource model on its own can't. So in a way, there is a sort of twisted logic to this. Certainly, it means that not just any author can come along and change whatever people say about his book, because he's the author and he knows best. It means that there must be some sort of collective opinion, and there must be other ways of checking and verifying. And certainly, Wikipedia is not meant to be anyone's blog, so they can't just go in there and say, well, I'm the author and I think this, because obviously that's not something that anyone else can outwardly verify. So there is something to this, and it actually goes to the point of what Wikipedia is about, which, as some people might not understand, certainly people who just use it as uh, unthinkingly as a resource, might not understand that Wikipedia is specifically and admittedly and on the record not about truth. It is not supposed to represent truth. It is supposed to represent verifiable collective opinion about what truth is. So that, for example, you can even go to the, uh, the Wikipedia entry on it itself on verifiability as one of the, the, the key thresholds for whether or not something can be put into Wikipedia. And it's, uh, it has quite an interesting write-up on this and the meaning of what truth is. So that, for example, it says uh, for those who protest, for example, about a Wikipedia entry, that, ah, oh, that's not true, I know the truth to be other than that. It says, for example, truth isn't always something as clear and unquestionable as we may desire. In many cases, such as in topics related with social science, there is no truth but simply opinions and assumptions. Which is the best political system? Was this or that government a good or a bad one? There are no true answers to such questions. There are facts, opinions, facts about opinions, and opinions about opinions. Besides, truth is only a Boolean value, 100% true or 100% false, in certain technical contexts, such as math and programming language. In most other topics, there is more than, than truths and lies under the sun. There are half-truths, lack of contexts, words with double or unclear meanings, logical fallacies, cherry-picked pieces of information to lead the reader to a predetermined conclusion, inadvertent reuse of someone else's lies, even misunderstandings. A statement may fail to adequately convey the state of affairs regarding some topic without that statement being an actual lie. 
So what then is the actual criteria for whether or not something gets into Wikipedia? Well, one of those criteria is verifiability. Can we actually verify that what this fact or opinion is saying is actually true? And if so, how do we go about doing that? What is the source? So it starts to talk about that in an interesting uh, sidebar here. It's, it says, but I know the truth. And it says, are you sure that's the case? Many times when everybody considers something to be one way, but you find something else that everybody, somewhere else that everybody is mistaken, and things were actually some other way, it's more likely that you have found a fringe theory. The stance on Wik Wikipedia on such things is to avoid giving undue weight to such minority ideas and represent instead the current state of understanding of a topic. If there is indeed an accuracy dispute between scholars, it is, it is described without taking part. If there is a universally accepted viewpoint and a tiny minority one, this last one may be ignored. Well, this is where we start to get into the heart of the matter and the heart of the problems with Wikipedia, and why it should not, of course, be taken as simply a resource of truth and facts and uh, things that can be absolutely certified. But I'm sure you all know there, <laughs> know that out there already. But we'll go into some more interesting pieces of this Wikipedia puzzle. First, let's take a short break, and we'll be right back to continue breaking this down. One day in Manhattan, clear as could be. Right, friends, welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. Once again, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and tonight we're talking about Wikipedia, the bastion of truthiness, which, surprisingly enough, admits that it is not meant to be a resource of truth, per se, but only about what, what happens to be the majority opinion on various issues and what reputable, citable secondary sources have to say on various issues. So, for example, we're talking about how verifiability, not truth, is the main criteria for what is given weight and credit on Wikipedia, and how fringe theories that go against the grain, even if they were to be true, would tend not to be published on Wikipedia because Wikipedia represents the collective opinion. So it goes on in this uh, part that I'm citing, and of course I'll put the link in the show notes for tonight's episode at corbettreport.com slash radio. It goes on to talk more about this, uh, this policy that they have, and it goes on to say, representing a majority viewpoint as such does not equal considering it true, and it is possible that everybody is actually mistaken indeed. For example, before Pasteur, Everybody considered the spontaneous generation theory to be true, and they were mistaken. Even so, if Wikipedia had existed before Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, it should have treated it as an accepted theory. And in this hypothetical scenario, what if Pasteur fixed the article on spontaneous generation after proving it was wrong? It wouldn't have been accepted. He would have been required to explain his theory in the regular scientific field and have it checked and approved by peers. Only at such point, Wikipedia would reflect changes in the acceptance of this theory. Why? Because Wikipedia does not know, nor have the resources to verify if either one is correct or incorrect, or to set apart an unpublished but revolutionary theory from a common fringe one. That's why it relies on verifiability rather than truth. And it goes on even further and more explicitly to say that editors are not truth finders. Quote, the Wikipedia doesn't reproduce verbatim text from other sources. What it does is summarizes content that some editors believe belong in, the Wiki in Wikipedia in the form of an encyclopedia summary that is verifiable from reliable sources. This process involves editors who are not making claims that they have found truth, but that they have found someone else who is making claims that they have found truth. Since there may be more than one set of facts or explanations for the facts in the article, there's a guideline for that, for that where multiple points of view, the Wikipedia's term for versions of truth, are included. Wikipedia editors are not indifferent to truth, but as a collaborative project, its editors are not making judgments as to what is true and what is false, but what can be verified in a reliable source and otherwise belongs in Wikipedia. Well, that actually seems somewhat reasonable. At the very least, they're not putting themselves up as the bastions of truth, and they're not trying to say that what everything that their articles contains is the truth, and that we must take them at their face value, more so that we simply have to take them as the collective, agreed-upon establishment opinion on various topics. And certainly, as that type of resource, it does that job pretty well, admirably well, one might say. 
but and, and, and it goes on even further. You can you can look into this even further, and you can find time and again when w- Wikipedia sources will basically state this policy and will will reiterate the fact that they're not about finding or displaying truth per se so much as collective majority opinion on any given matter so for example we can turn to an article from insidehighered.com a higher education periodical which had a uh, a article about uh, Middlebury College which actually banned citing Wikipedia as a source in student essays back in 2007 and in this article called a stand against Wikipedia they quote a spokeswoman for Wikipedia And it says, quote, Wikipedia officials agree in part with Middlebury's history department. It's a sensible policy to not allow Wikipedia as a source citation in articles. Sandra Ordonez, a spokeswoman, said in an email interview, Wikipedia is the ideal place to start your research and get a global picture of a topic. However, it is not an authoritative source. In fact, we recommend that students check the facts they find in Wikipedia against other sources. Additionally, it is generally good research practice to cite an original source when writing a paper or completing an exam. It's usually not advisable, particularly at the university level, to cite an encyclopedia. End quote. Well, again, I think that's perfectly reasonable, and that's a pretty good response from someone at Wikipedia to give. Certainly, they shouldn't be promoting their their Wikipedia, their encyclopedia, as a resource that people should use as the end point of anyone's research. But as a beginning point to find what people are saying about a given topic, well, it's fairly reliable in that sense. But, of course, this isn't exactly the way it's perceived by the public, or at least not the way most people understand Wikipedia to be. Most people, to the extent that they give it any thought whatsoever, will think, well, if there is a something in dispute, we'll just check it on Wikipedia, and that will solve the dispute. For certain basic facts about calculable things, that may or may not be worthy, and that might, might actually work out. So that, for example, if you want to know what date Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, well, Wikipedia is probably a good place to go to find out that information. But if you want to know why Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, you're probably going to need to de- de- to delve a little deeper and go beyond what's cited in the Wikipedia article. Again, this shouldn't come as much of a surprise to anyone out there in my listening audience, I, I suppose, but I think it's important for us to put some of this on the table and to think, what is the use of something like Wikipedia? Do we have to throw this baby out with the bathwater, or can we use sources like this as at least a starting point for our own investigations, or at least a way to find out more about what the collective opinion on any given subject might be? Well, we'll start delving into this a little more after the break. If you want to get in with your thoughts on Wikipedia or sources online, 1-800-313-9443. That's 1-800-313-9443. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. Welcome back. Here we are on the Republic Broadcasting Network on this Monday night edition of the broadcast talking about Wikipedia and verifiability versus truth and all of the sticky, thorny issues we get into when this one collective encyclopedia starts to become the go-to source on basically any question that people have under the sun. And that has been helped along somewhat, we'll say, by uh, s- such well-connected insider organizations like Google, making sure that Wikipedia entries always go to the very top of the search uh, search results for pretty much anything you can think of. So certainly Wikipedia has been engineered to be the go-to resource for basically anyone looking for information online at least the people who won't look past the first few entries of any given search term. And unfortunately, I think there are far too many people like that out there. So Wikipedia has been certainly positioned to be this source of knowledge and this encyclopedia for all of humanity. And as such, it is occupying a very, very important role in collecting and annotating and directing people to information in this paradigm. But Again, I don't think I need to explain to the listeners of this program why that is so dangerous, especially because, of course, Wikipedia will not allow discussion of 9-11 uh, truth or or the truth about any of the other subjects that we, we talk about here on the program in their main articles on any of those very important subjects. In fact, the key defining subjects of our generation. 
And it's not simply uh, the case that they will exclude that information altogether, but often they'll have an entirely separate entry, for example, for 9-11 conspiracy theories, in which people can talk about all the various theories that people are proposing, but none of that information shall ever get onto the main uh, Wikipedia page about 9-11 and what took place then. So it is an interesting segregation of information and really putting pieces of information in separate places so that people are less likely to come over them. And there's a lot of, to be talked about here and a lot that, that we have to consider, but let's let's take a moment to talk about that thing in the Wikipedia guidelines I was reading from earlier, that they talked about the concept of undue weight, giving undue weight to minority opinions so that even if something is true and demonstrably verifiably true, the fact that most people tend to believe something else means that that other opinion, the untrue opinion, will tend to be what's reflected in Wikipedia. This is an important point, and it, it uh, again, plays itself out quite interestingly in some very specific cases. So let's just take a look at one specific case. This comes from Chronicle.com from earlier this year, back in February. They wrote a post, uh, they published a post from Timothy Messer Cruz, who wrote The Undue Weight of Truth on Wikipedia. And he writes, quote, For the past 10 years, I've immersed myself in the details of one of the most famous events in American labor history, the Haymarket Riot and Trial of 1886. Along the way, I've written two books and a couple of articles about the episode. In some circles, that affords me a presumption of expertise on the subject. Not, however, on Wikipedia. The bomb thrown dur during an anarchist rally in Chicago sparked America's first Red Scare, a high-profile show trial, and a worldwide clemency movement for the seven condemned men. Today, the martyrs' graves are a national historic site, the location of the bombing is marked by a public sculpture, and the event is recounted in most American history textbooks. Its Wikipedia entry is detailed and elaborate. A couple of years ago, on a slow day at the office, I decided to experiment with editing one particularly misleading assertion chiseled into the Wikipedia article. The description of the trial stated, The prosecution, led by Julius Grinnell, did not offer evidence connecting any of the defendants with the bombing. Coincidentally, that is the claim that initially hooked me on the topic. In 2001, I was teaching a labor history course, and our textbook contained nearly the same wording that appeared on Wikipedia. One of my students raised her hand. If the trial went on for six weeks and no evidence was presented, what did they talk about all those days? I've been working to answer her question ever since. I have not resolved all the mysteries that surround the bombing, but I have dug deeply enough to be sure that the claim that the trial was bereft of evidence is flatly wrong. 118 witnesses were called to testify, many of them unindicted co-conspirators who detailed secret meetings where plans to attack police stations were mapped out, coded messages were placed in radical newspapers, and bombs were assembled in one of the defendant's rooms. It was one of the first uses of forensic chemistry in an American courtroom. The city's forensic chemist showed that the metallurgical profile of a bomb found in one of the anarchist's homes was unlike any commercial, commercial metal, but was similar in composition to a piece of shrapnel cut from the body of a slain police officer. So overwhelming was the evidence against one of the defendants that his lawyers even admitted that their client spent the afternoon before the Haymarket rally building, bombings, building bombs, arguing that he was acting in self-defense. So I removed the line about there being no evidence and provided a full explanation in Wikipedia's behind-the-scenes editing log. Within minutes, my changes were reversed. The explanation? You must provide reliable sources for your assertions to make changes along these lines to the article. That was curious, as I had cited the documents that proved my point, including verbatim testimony from the trial published online by the Library of Congress. I also noted one of my own peer-reviewed articles. One of the people who had assumed the role of keeper of this bit of history for Wikipedia quoted the website's undue weight policy, which states that articles should not give minority views as much or as detailed a description as more popular views. He then scolded me. You should not delete information supported by the majority of sources to replace it with a minority view. The undue weight policy posed a problem. Scholars have been publishing the same ideas about the Haymarket case for more than a century. 
The last published bi bi bibliography of titles on the subject had 1,530 entries. The undue weight excuse, <laughs> excuse me, explain to me then how a minority source with facts on its side would ever appear a, a, would ever appear against a wrong majority one. I asked the wiki gatekeeper. He responded, you're more than welcome to discuss reliable sources here. That's what the talk page is for. However, you might want to have a quick look at Wikipedia's civility policy. I tried to edit the page again. Within 10 seconds, I was informed that my citations to the primary documents were insufficient, as Wikipedia requires its contributors to rely on secondary sources, or, as my critics informed me, published books. Another editor cheerfully tutored me in what this means. Wikipedia is not truth. Wikipedia is verifiability of reliable sources. Hence, if most secondary sources which are taken as reliable happen to repeat a flawed account or description of something, Wikipedia will echo that. Tempted to win simply through sheer tenacity, I edited the page again. My triumph was even more fleeting than before. Within seconds, the page was changed back. The reason? Reverting possible vandalism. Fearing that I would forever have to wear the scarlet letter of Wikipedia vandal, I relented, but noted with some consolation that in the wake of my protest, the editors made a slight gesture of reconciliation. They added the word credible, so that it now read, the prosecution, led by Julius Grinnell, did not offer credible evidence connecting any of the defendants with the bombing. Though that was still inaccurate, I decided not to attempt to correct the entry again until I could clear the hurdles my anonymous interlocutors had set before me. So I waited two years until my book on the trial was published. Now, at last, I have a proper Wikipedia leg to stand on, I thought, as I opened the page and found at least a dozen statements that were factual errors, including some that contradicted their own cited sources. I found myself hesitant to write, eerily aware that the self-deputized protectors of the page were reading over my shoulder, itching to revert my edits and tutor me in wiki decorum. I made a small edit, testing the waters. My improvement lasted five minutes before a wiki cop scolded me. I hope you will familiarize yourself with some of Wikipedia's policies, such as verifiability and undue weight. If all historians, save one, say that the sky was green in 1888, our policies require that we write, most historians wrote that the sky was green, but one says that the sky was blue. As individual editors, we're not in the business of weighing claims, just reporting what reliable sources write. I guess this gives me a glimmer of hope that someday, perhaps before another century goes by, enough of my fellow scholars will adopt my views that I can change that Wikipedia entry. Until then, I will have to continue to shout that the sky was blue. Once again, that's the story of Timothy Messer Cruz and his travels and travails trying to change the Wikipedia entry on the Haymarket riot and the trial of 1886. So an interesting little behind-the-scenes glimpse into what it takes to actually get truth past the truth gatekeepers on Wikipedia. And the idea of truth gatekeeping really isn't so far out for anyone who's really taken the time to look at the subject, because there are certain articles, in fact, any article worth writing about has been locked down and is uh, under constant scrutiny by the self-appointed gatekeepers who get to decide what really goes in or out and will often use such ideas as the weight, undue weight theory as to what will or will not be allowed in. So it doesn't matter if something's true, if enough people believe something else, then that belief will be reflected in the Wikipedia article, not the truth. And again, even if you have the primary source document to cite of the actual evidence that was presented at the trial, well, that's not good enough. You need people writing about that evidence. So it is a very, very interesting, sticky situation that once again, if people understand Wikipedia for what it is, then it's not really a problem. As long as we understand this is not the truth, it's not even an attempt to portray the truth, it's an attempt to portray the majority opinion on any given subject, then we can use it for the resource that it is. And uh, let me be upfront and, and honest, absolutely I do use Wikipedia as a resource when I'm making my videos or writing my, my articles, etc. But only in a certain sense. So that, for example, recently I was writing an article on the flash crash of 2010, that day on the markets in uh, May of 2010, when the Dow Jones 
declined by 1,000 points in a matter of hours. Uh, absolutely just unthinkable loss on the Dow Jones that could not have just happened by accident. It was clearly something that had been staged in some way by some, in some form. And so I was writing about this recently for my subscriber newsletter when I decided to, uh, to check on the role of high-frequency trading algorithms in the flash crash of 2010. And so I decided to start by finding out what the majority opinion on this was. What is the official explanation for the flash crash of 2010? Obviously, at the time, it was being speculated that it was a fat finger trade. Someone had just slipped and hit an extra zero somewhere and accidentally traded too much, and that started the, the crash. But uh, I wanted to see where things had gone to since then in terms of the majority opinion on that matter. So I just typed in flash crash 2010 into startpage.com and... Lo and behold, there it is at the very, very top is the Wikipedia entry on the 2010 flash crash. And if you go there knowing specifically what it is you're looking for and what you want to find, it's actually a pretty, pretty easy to use Wikipedia as a tool. So for in my case, I wanted to find out about the algorithms that are uh, that were responsible or could have been responsible for the flash crash and what people thought of that. So in my version of Firefox here on my Mac, I just press Command F, that would be Control F for those of you on a Windows, and just typed in the word algorithm. And it starts to highlight all of the words uh, algorithm. Anytime algorithm appears in this entry, it starts to highlight them. And with that, it, within literally a matter of about five seconds, I could find links to some sources on what people say about the use of high frequency trading algorithms in the 2010 flash crash. So, for example, the first uh, source that it'll point you to is footnote number nine. And if you just click on that little number nine, it will take you down to the bottom in the sources cited. And it will show you the link to number nine, which is actually a Wall Street Journal article called How a Trading Algorithm Went Awry. And then if you click through to that Wall Street Journal article, you'll find uh, an, uh, one account of what happened on that day. So that, for example, it says, At 2.32 p.m., a trader at Waddell and Reed placed a huge order to sell E-mini futures, futures contracts, which mimic movements in the S&P 500 stock index. This kind of trade wasn't unusual for Waddell, which at the time managed some $25 billion, including the popular IV Asset Strategy Fund. As part of the fund strategy, the firm from time to time places bets that the broad stock market will fall as a hedge against its individual stock holdings. Also not unusual was that Waddell placed the trade using a computer program known as a trading algorithm designed to stand in for a human trader and parse out buying or selling based on differing variables. Generally, traders opt for algorithms that consider trading volume, price changes, and the amount of time to complete a trade. But Waddell's desk opted for an algorithm designed to sell 75,000 e-mini contracts at a pr pace that would range up to 9% of trading volume and not take into account other factors. The report details how a similar size trade earlier in 2010 took five hours to execute, but in this case, the Waddell trade unloaded on the market in just 20 minutes. As the Waddell trade hit the futures markets, the joint report said, the likely buyers included high-frequency trading firms. A key feature of high-frequency trading firms is that they quickly exit trades, and by 241, they were also aggressively selling the e-mini contracts that had they had bought from Waddell, which was still trying to sell the remainder of its contracts. <coughs> etc, etc. The report goes on from there, but uh, basically you have this Wall Street Journal entry that's based, basing itself on a 104-page report from the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, that represents the official story of what happened during the May 6, 2010 cra flash crash. And uh, in fact, that SEC report is also linked up in the Wikipedia entry, and that's um, uh, footnote number eight. So you have the SEC report, you have various articles that were written about the report, all talking about the role of high-frequency trading algorithms in the May 2010 flash crash. And so for someone like myself who was in the position of believing, yes, the algorithms were at the very least partly responsible for getting that flash crash going and rolling, and if you want to check, well, what does the what is the official opinion on this? In literally about 10 seconds, you can find a, a resource to that on Wikipedia. So that's generally how I will use Wikipedia. If I want to check the majority opinion on some matter, I'll go into the Wikipedia entry on it, find find some of the sources, look down at the sources cited list, and go off to there. 
Of course, I never use Wikipedia in and of itself as a resource. I just use it as that quick and easy and dirty way to find out what the majority opinion on any given subject is. Of course, as you know from listening to the Corbett Report, it obviously, we have to go much further than that and we have to start looking at the, uh, the pieces of information that contradict what's written in the Wikipedia articles and you're never gonna find that through Wikipedia. You're going to have to turn to other sources. And that's where the alternative media comes in in hopefully taking and congregating and collaborating and getting some of this information that proves the other side of what's going on and the things that they're not talking about on Wikipedia. But at the very least, it's good to know what the majority opinion is on certain subjects because who knows, maybe you have a hunch that high frequency trading algorithms had a role in the 2010 flash crash. And instead of trying to convince a skeptical public of this or that source, you can just point them to the Wikipedia entry. You can point them to the Wall Street Journal. You can have the SEC report up on your screen in seconds, pointing them to the very source coming straight from the horse's mouth, showing exactly what you wanted. So in that sense, it can be a valuable resource. A lot more to say, but let's take another short break and we'll be back to wrap things up right after this. All right, friends, welcome back. Here we are in the final moments of Corbett Report Radio for this Monday night edition of the broadcast. And tonight we've been talking about Wikipedia and truthiness and verifiability and some of these other age old questions of philosophy that we've been wrestling with for thousands of years, and here is Wikipedia to provide the answers for us. Well, of course not. And of course we have to take these types of things with a grain of salt, but it does not mean, I think, that we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think it means that we have to be smart about the ways that we use resources like Wikipedia to look and, and to know what kind of information they're going to be providing us with. Not the truth, but the majority opinion on what the truth is, which is important to understand so that we at least know what it is we're refuting and how to refute it, assuming that we do disagree with that majority opinion. But again, it is and it can be valuable and it can lead us to sources that will uh, be good sources for us to, to explore and to take on board with that proviso, of course, that we always have to be aware of what our sources are and why we're using them. But again, I think it's somewhat like the mainstream media in general. I think there's the tendency just to dismiss anything that comes out of the mainstream media because it is the mainstream media. And while I suppose that's a healthier position than believing anything they say because they're the mainstream media, it still seems somewhat self-defeating to me. I think that we have to take on board the things that the mainstream media does well, which is often just to report plain facts and figures and, the thi and to understand the things that they do horribly and, of course, on purpose hor horribly, which is provide the context and to provide the, the actual meaning of what's going on rather than the spin and the corporate PR pro propaganda of the government and the government mouthpieces. So absolutely, I think it's a complicated question of what sources to use to find out the truth on any given matter. And as always, I think it relies on a wide range of sources. We have to use sources like Wikipedia and the mainstream media and also the, the quasi-alternative media, the foundation-funded alternative media, and also the real independent alternative media. And I think with all of those sources on board, we can come to a better understanding of not only what actually is, but what people believe actually is. And that can be as important as knowing the truth as well, because we have to understand what people what people believe, what they think, what's commonly accepted, so that we know how better to target our own message. So lots and lots to think about. I hope that at the very least we do start the broader societal conversation about what resources like Wikipedia are supposed to be and what they can be. But turning to some programming notes, I just uh, want to uh, to reflect on the fact that I, I've heard from some people that there were some technical difficulties with Friday night's broadcast of this radio show. So if you are a listener to the live broadcast, either on the radio or on the Republic Broadcasting streams, I'd just like to let you know that all of the radio broadcasts are backed up on my own servers and they should have the, the proper backup of the, the full uh, episode of this episode and every other episode. And of course, all of the show notes for every episode so that you can find all of the articles and videos and documents, etc. that I talk about in any given episode will be up there at CorbettReport.com radio. So just go to CorbettReport.com and click on the radio 
radio tab and you'll find it there. Once again, the archives and all of this uh, work is brought to you by you, so thank you once again to all the subscribers of the Corbett Report out there, all of you who have clicked on the support chat tab and are subscribed to pay a small monthly fee once a month to me. I couldn't do it without you, so absolutely thank you all out there for that. And thank you all for listening. I truly do appreciate your comments and your support and your feedback and all of that. So keep it on coming. I will keep this broadcast coming to you. And on that note, we're going to leave it there. But we'll be back for tomorrow night's edition of Corbett Report Radio, 23 hours. So until then, thank you all for listening. Take care.